Good morning. Okay. Uh, well, open your Bibles to uh, Psalm 61. And we'll read beginning in, in verse 1. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, you can follow along using the screens on my right and left. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Amen? Amen. Well, I've said this before. um, My least favorite time of day is bedtime for my kids. Uh, If you have kids, you know what I'm talking about. My wife and I have had long, long strategy meetings where we decide which kids go into which rooms and which times they go down at and where, like, cups of water need to be and stuffed animals. Just doing everything we can to make bedtime efficient. We have these long meetings together. I assume that my kids are having the same strategy meetings. (laughs) You're like, I'm going to go ask for water. You're going to poop your pants. You're going to bonk your head really hard and cry so that the baby wakes up. We can drag this out. 90 more minutes if we have to. My daughter said, Dad, bedtime puts me in a bad mood. I said, oh, yeah? My kids uh, are expressing sadness. All of us have probably seen or maybe even remember when we were kids and bedtime made us sad. See kids cry about bedtime almost every single night. My kids are learning what they should and shouldn't be sad about. They, don't not yet, they do not yet know that bedtime is not really a thing to be sad about. And the older they get, the more excited they will be about bedtime. <laughs> uh, they're learning how to express their sadness and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, this is a psalm of lament, of expressing sadness. It's, it's a psalm about how one pours up their heart to God, even in lament. And, and the word uh, that David uses at the beginning are really sharp. He says, from the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. The most likely context in David's life for when he wrote this psalm was when he was on the run from his son Absalom. You guys heard of that story before? M- many of you may have. David had a son. He was David was king and his son was named Absalom and He favored this son, and Absalom was wise, and he was handsome according to the people. The people's hearts, in a certain sense, went after Absalom. But the relationship between King David and his son Absalom, over time, deteriorated. More and more awful things happened. More tragedy entered into the situation. There was revenge. There was murder. And it got to the point where Absalom took over the throne of David... And David had to go into exile. We hear that the people's hearts went after Absalom. That Absalom took control of the capital city. We read that Ahithophel, one of David's closest advisors, abandons him to go and serve his son Absalom. So David is out in the wilderness now. He's not in the city. And Absalom uh, raises an army to go out and deal finally with King David. But Absalom's killed in battle. And a messenger finds David, and he delivers to David the news of his son Absalom. And here are David's words. What happens? It says, The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son. My son Absalom. Would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. There are lots of tragic stories in the Bible. There are not many that I think really reach this level of heartache. Just consider the ways that David is broken. He's no longer ruling in the way a king should. 
He's geographically displaced from the capital city. The people's hearts are no longer after him. He's been betrayed by his son and his closest advisors. He's certainly considering what led to his son despising him so much. And at the end of it all, the son whom he still loves dies, is killed in battle. David says in this psalm, from the end of the earth. David is not literally at the end of the earth. He's speaking metaphorically. A way we might translate it in modern day English is to say that David is saying he is at the end of his rope. Does that phrase make sense to most people? He's holding on, doesn't have a lot left. David provides a model of lament here for us. He teaches us how to lament. Now, I think sometimes people are sad when they shouldn't be. And I think everyone experiences different degrees of sadness at different experiences in their life. But all of us here, I would say, at some point or another, have had some sort of problem. Anyone here not had a problem yet? (laughs) Just waiting for someone to be like me. David uh, begins with the assumption that God is good. That's where he begins. He doesn't look at the world and try and do all of the math and then decide after he has weighed everything whether or not God is good. Instead, he begins by saying God is good and leaves the weighing up to God. As Christians, who is our Lord? Jesus. Jesus is Lord, and for thousands of years, Christians have proclaimed that really basic Christian confession. Not the entirety of Christian theology, but a really good summary of it. Jesus is Lord. Is Jesus Lord of your life? I'll give you lots of chances to respond. Is Jesus Lord of your family? Is he Lord of your marriage? Of your children? Of your belongings? Of your finances? Of your career? Okay, Jesus is Lord of every single part, uh, uh, faculty, division of your life. Everything that you have, Jesus is Lord of. Here's what's important for you to remember. Jesus is also Lord of the end of your rope. That he's Lord of your crisis. That when you are confused or broken or deflated or concerned or despairing, That Jesus is Lord in that moment as well. That he's no less loving, he's no less beautiful, he's no less marvelous, no less magnificent, no less wise, no less powerful, no less capable there at the end of your rope than with any other part or any other time in your life. So David has real stuff going on here. Probably beyond what most of us has experienced, though I can't be sure. And he laments to a God that he fundamentally believes is good. He shows us how to lament. We request, we remember, and we respond. Reading it with me, verses 1 through 4. David says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. I want us to notice how this psalm does not begin. We can read, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. We don't read, how dare you, O God, meet my demands. I know, sometimes when I've really wanted things, a request to God slowly changes into a demand of God. It's like God was on a 15-minute break and my life fell apart and I want him to get back and, you know, do his job. And it seems even sacrilegious to say that. The problem is many of us pray that way. 
our hearts lean in towards demanding things from God and not requesting things from God, David, from the beginning, is requesting. He's saying, please. I know that we don't see the specific language here between request and demand, but we know about David, and we can read the rest of this psalm, and we understand that David has a big view of God, so he makes requests, not demands. Here's the other way that we pray, I I think sometimes it's wrong. Uh, Instead of looking up to God, we sort of give up on God. We either don't think he will answer prayers, or we don't want to bother him with our prayers. We think it's too small or insignificant. We don't want to be the guy that's always sending like messages to God that overwhelm him. I know some people here probably have that concern when they pray. Uh, not praying leads to more prayerlessness, which leads to the outer darkness. Christian people should be praying people. Over and over and over and over again in the Bible, we're told pray. We're told pray. We're told when we have something that is brought to our attention, it is appropriate and good to bring it to the attention of God. So David does that here. He prays for the Lord's protection and for his presence. He says that he wants to be led to the rock that is higher than him. He uses the metaphor of a rock. David has spent a fair amount of his life on the run. We think earlier in his life, uh, Saul was chasing after him, so he's out in the wilderness, and he knows the sorts of rocks that can protect you and the sorts of rocks that can't protect you. He wants to be led to a rock that's high and that will protect him. He's using the metaphor that's really familiar to his own life experiences. David knew how to hide in rocks. The thing is, though, it's not just generally a rock. I believe David is referring to God as rock. We don't have that expressed here very, very explicitly, but we we have it in other places. We can go to Psalm 31. Uh, David says, You are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. Uh, Moses also speaks about God as a rock in Deuteronomy. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. David is not content just to be protected. He wants God to be his protection. Just imagine in one sense, David could ask for a big rock or a fortress to hide in that would thwart spears being thrown in his direction, or he can request the protection of the God who is actually holding the molecules and those spears together, who can disperse them at word who sovereignly lord over any arm that throws a spear. David is asking for the most supreme form of protection. Here's the point. When people think about being safe, most people will go to their bank accounts or their health care programs or their emotional support systems. I'm not saying any of those things are wrong. I'm saying they actually won't keep you safe. As Christians, now, in this covenant, Who is our rock? Jesus is our rock. The one through whom everything was made and the one who is sustaining all things in creation now and the one in whom all things will be drawn together. We read that the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. He's not just a carpenter. He was fully man, but he was fully God. Yahweh returned to his people. David doesn't just say that he wants the rock he says lead me to the rock lead me to the rock how many of you in the last month or so have gone and swam in the ocean it is it's right there guys like it's nearby i feel like it's a really low number of people who swim in the ocean okay how many of you have ever swam in the ocean okay (laughs) you have lifeguards right what do lifeguards do they come out and save you is that right um, imagine you're out in the ocean and you kind of wave down a lifeguard. I actually don't know if you have to wave them down or if they're looking for you. Um, and the lifeguard swims out and he says, yes, safety's that way. And you're like, cool. And he's like, the water's dangerous. You're going to die here. Go that way. What would you, would you ask for? Yeah, he'd say, help me. Like, I can't make it on my own. I see that there's safety over there, but you need to lead me to it. 
David is proclaiming even in this psalm that the salvation he knows is available is only offered to him through the power of God, and he can only be led there by the power of God. That he doesn't take it for himself, that it's given to him, that he is led to it. That is a safety and protection outside the exertion of his own ability. He's saying, God has to take me to the rock. It's the gospel right here in Psalm 61. It's, it's David saying, the things that you get from God are given to you. You cannot get them on your own. He said, I want to be safe. I want to be safe in, in God. And he knows that God has to take him there. Just like the amount of rest that should offer us. For those who have called on the name of Jesus, you've been brought to the higher rock. You've been given a salvation that you could not have earned and that no one can take away. We can rest in that truth, Hope Chapel. He doesn't just ask for God's protection. He also asks for God's presence. Read with me verse 4. David says, Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. The language that David uses is becoming progressively more intimate and more intense. He wants a rock. He wants a refuge. He wants a tower. He wants a tent. He wants to be under the wings of God's protection. He does not just want to be with God and be protected by God. He wants to know God. He wants to be protected by God in the way that a mother bird protects her offspring. We have another image of this uh, in, in Ruth. Do you guys remember the story of Ruth? Yes. Good. 9 a.m. didn't really remember the story of Ruth. <laughs> Ruth is a Moabite. She's a widow. She's a foreigner. And she casts her, uh, her soul, essentially, into the hands of the God of Israel. And we read this uh, being said to her by Boaz, who would be her kinsman redeemer. He says, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What really strikes me in this section, though, is the word uh, dwell. David says, Let me dwell in your tent forever. He says this in Psalm 27. One thing I have asked of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Or in, in Psalm 23, he says that he might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, David is asking to be a member of God's household. He's saying, I want to be there. I want to live with you. I want to know you and know more about you. I want to be in your presence. He's not willing to settle for God's protection. He wants also for God's presence. In fact, um, it's, I think, kind of important that he says the word tent here. Uh, David is on the move. A house is a permanent dwelling, so he wants God to be with him on the move. There's a tent he can take up and take down. David asks for God to dwell, uh, for him to be able to dwell with God, to dwell in God's tent or dwell in God's house. Um, but we have an even greater hope or at least a more specific hope than this uh, look at john uh 1 14. you guys might know this passage and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory is the only son from the father full of grace and truth uh the word there for dwell is the same sort of word it's the idea of tabernacling david said god i want to live with you i want to dwell with you and god although he responds to david immediately in the long run responds by then sending his son to dwell with his people jesus dwelt with us god's answer to the problem of sin was not simply to answer it from heaven but to dwell among us to live the way that we live but perfectly to die the way we die humiliatingly and be raised on the third day so that we might, because of the work of Jesus Christ, enter into the household of God. You can dwell with God. In fact, we believe as Christians that God right now, the Holy Spirit, dwells with us. Amen? Do you want to dwell with God? I mean, I know there are probably different periods in different people's lives where they want it more and they want it less. May it be your prayer this week that 
you ask God to give you a stronger and stronger desire to be in his presence. So we request and then we remember. Verses 5 through 7. Uh, For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. What David is doing here is drawing a distinction between perception and reality. Have you ever had like a clarity moment in your life where you step back and look at something and that context makes you realize that your perception of something was not the way it really was? Ever happened? Oh, here's a more like visceral example. Have you ever had a dream that gave you such a strong emotion that when you woke up you couldn't shake it? I hate that. Do you hate that? I hate that my dumb brain does that to me. Like I'll have a dream that my kids are kidnapped and I'll wake up at 3 a.m. and I'll run and, you know, look in all their rooms and I'll see like their feet sticking out of their blankets. I'm like, okay, all right. I'll lay back down. I was like, I didn't see their faces. I get back up and walk back in. Like this emotion has power over my actions in the real world. I dream something and my brain is like, yeah, just make sure it's not true, right? Um, What I have to do is trade the less real thing for the more real thing. I have to shed the emotion of the less real dream I had in which my kids were taken away from me. For the more real thing, they're safe in their beds. David is trading the less real thing for the more real thing. Here's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that David's suffering is not real. I'm not saying that David's situation is not real. I'm saying it's less real than something else. David's already been given a promise from God, a covenant from God. In the early years of his kingly life, uh, the Lord says to David through his prophet, we we read this, um, Now therefore, thus you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? Forever. God reminds David of what he's already done for him, the provision that he's given to him. He also reminds David of the promises that he's made to him. So when David remembers, he remembers both of these things. He remembers the provision of God, and he remembers the promises of of God. I have tried to exercise the practice of gratitude when I'm unhappy with something in my life. Did anybody ever try this? You begin to think about the good things that God has given you. You ever write them down in like a prayer journal? I think that's good practice. I think it's good to be reminded of what it is that God has given you. I think it provides you with perspective. I know that everyone in here has been given things by God. Everyone in here has probably been provided by God, from, by, provided for by God in ways that they did not expect. And it is good for us to remember what God has done for us. But it's not enough. I'm going to explain what I mean. Uh, I go on a trip to Sacramento three or four times a year. I take the 99, not the 5. The 5 is a joke. If you take the 5, you're wrong. I will die on that hill, take the 99. And as I drive up to Sacramento, I see signs that say, Sacramento, 380 miles. What does the 380 mean? Yes, it's, it's a long way to go. It's how far I am from Sacramento <laughs> in hours, right? And as I drive, the mileage gets lower, right? Uh, 250, 210, 190, 181. And at 150, I just decide to stop, get out of my car, build a little house, run water and power, maybe make some friends, 
and stay there. Why is that wrong? Because I haven't gotten to Sacramento, right? But the sign says Sacramento. See, I think the thing is, um, we often confuse the sign for the city. We settle. We settle. Uh, I'm not saying the signs aren't helpful. I'm not saying they aren't good reminders. I think that's true about provision as well. It reminds us that God is good. But the promises of God are far better than any way he's provided for us materially in our lives. Far, far, far better. Do not settle for the sign. Go to the city. David uh, remembers the promises that God has made to him. He switches to the third person here. He says, the king instead of I. He still means himself. In 6 and 7, we read, prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. Uh, I think this is the most confusing section in this psalm. Because David is asking for things that seem like God could not even give him. Prolong the life of the king, yes. May his years endure to all generations. Huh. Is David asking to become immortal? May he be enthroned forever before God. There's that forever again. Okay, good. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. These promises have an immediate fulfillment in the life of David, but they stretch out way past him in human history. And they're ultimately fulfilled in the son of David, that is Jesus. The way that the kingly line goes on forever. The answer that God gives David is far bigger than what he asks for. I just want to like pause there for a moment. David prays boldly. Have you ever prayed boldly? David prays boldly. He asks for a lot. He asks for the protection of God and for the presence of God. God gives him so much more than he could have asked for. David had no specific idea of the way in which God would send his own son, a member of David's line, to offer redemption to every human sinner on the planet who might call on the name of Jesus. God answered David's prayer far more abundantly than he had asked. I believe that God makes us, has made us promises in his word. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Okay. I think a lot of people tell you that God promised you things that he didn't. God didn't promise you lots of money. God didn't promise you perfect health. He didn't promise you the exact life that you wanted. I don't believe it. Is, is it name it and claim it? Is that right? I don't believe in that. Uh, I think sometimes God gives you what your heart desires. I think sometimes he changes your heart desire. I think sometimes he commands you to be patient. And as we learned from Mike last week, wait on him. But I do think he gives us real and specific promises that are far better than anything that we could ask for. I'm I'm just going to read a bunch of them to you. I'm going to read a bunch of Bible verses in a row. Is that okay with you? I was going to do it no matter what you said. God gave us these promises. They are for you. They are for you. If you have called on the name of Jesus, these promises are for you. Look at Ephesians 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus For by grace, you have been saved through what? And this is not your own doing. It is a of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. That promise, if you've called on the name of Jesus, is for you. 
If you've called on the name of Jesus, you have already now been led to the rock that is higher than you. You have a salvation granted to you, not because you are good, but because God is good and nothing can take that away. Rest in that promise. It's yours. Look at another one. Second Corinthians. Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is not saying, I'm going to muscle my way through a difficult life. Paul is saying, no matter how difficult my life is, no matter how weak I feel, I know that God is capable to take bad things and bring about good things. God did the greatest thing in all of human history with a public execution. God is a God of redemption, of turning things around. Largely, corporately, globally, and I also believe individually in each of our lives. That's a promise for you. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How many of you would consider yourselves to be anxious people? If you need to use two hands, use two hands. (laughs) Hands up. God says, bring your anxieties to me. Bring them to me. God says, bring your anxieties to me and I will grant you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Whatever understanding I think I have, God says, I have a peace that surpasses it. How about this one? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is a famous passage. It's not often used as a promise passage. Though. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We use this passage for evangelism and missions, and we should use it. But like tucked at the end of this missions verse is the like one of the best promises in the New Testament. Jesus says, I've got lots of stuff for you to do. And you're like, oh. he's like, I'll be with you all the time, all the way to the end. That's a powerful promise. What problem could you have that would be bigger than that? All of our problems seem bigger than us. None of them are bigger than God. And he is with us. He says to the end of the age. Um, I just, this last year and a half, I've been getting asked lots of questions about revelations, is it the end of the world, stuff like that. So I've been thinking more about that. And I think what struck me so profoundly over this last year or so is that um, there's a lot of uncertainty in many ways, right? But we know how it ends. I, I, know, I know I've said that maybe the last few times I've preached, it's because it's really struck me that like I've been walking around with a book that tells me how history ends. Like, I know the ending. That's a profound way that God promises hope to us. He says, yeah, there's going to be lots of ups and downs, but let me tell you how it ends. God wins. He takes his bride. New heavens and new earth. Everything's fantastic. I just think think about it a lot. (laughs) I want to show you a picture of the end. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Jesus says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Promises for you. The promise is for you. And it's for those who today, who are here or who are watching, who are broken. Who are confused, who are afraid, who are impoverished who are deflated, the promises are for you. I can offer you nothing better than to rest in the promises of God. 
Lastly, we respond. Read verse 8. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. It strikes me that uh, David's problems are more complex than any of the problems I've ever had in my life. I think Mike spoke about this last week. Like, you know, none of us have been kings, I don't think. Haven't had any kingdoms. Haven't been pursued by my son to murder me. Do you understand, like, there's a sense in which his problems are bigger than at least any of the problems I've had, as far as I know. Probably most of our problems, maybe not all of them. And they're complex. And it's hard to see the beauty amidst the tragedy. But, but David's response, after he has made his request to God, after he has remembered what God has done and what God will do, his response is to worship and obey. It is a relief that it's that simple. (laughs) Remember, David begins, and we should begin, with the assumption that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is just, and that God is righteous. And then when we look out at the world, when we look at what's happening in our lives, we're not having to do the math to find out whether God is those things. We believe he's those things, and we leave the math up to him. That's what David does. First in worship, when David and we see the works of God through his word or in the world, we should respond with worship. There's a lot we could say about David. Yeah, he killed a giant. Became the first good king of Israel, he did all kinds of really amazing things. But this quality of David that I find so interesting is that he just wrote tons of songs. Like he's got a bunch of like chord charts in a file somewhere. He's writing music. Like this is a song that he wrote, a thing he made to worship God. Not in a good time in his life. There's just like this surreal, I don't know, like picture out of my head of David in this moment of tragedy. He hears that his son Absalom has died. He doesn't know how good could come out of it. And he he picks his stringed instrument up, as we read here, and he writes this song. David worships when it's good, and he worships when it's bad. I know many of us, in harder times, have arrived at church... And we've not wanted to worship. But when we give in to it, it works, right? It is never a bad thing to lift up the name of Jesus, to be faithful in worship and praise to our God, no matter what's going on. Amen? Worship and obedience. It's called worship by conduct. You obey. David says, I'll perform my vows day after day. I don't need a show of hands here, but many of us, when something goes bad in our lives, it becomes a breeding ground of sin. We're mad at God and we're not going to listen to what he has to say. Uh, Moments of crisis, moments where you're at the end of your rope is always a crossroads. Crossroads between choosing your own way or leaning into the goodness of God and obedience. All of them. Every crisis Every end of your rope is an opportunity to not choose God or to choose God. Jesus is the Lord of the end of your rope. For those of you who are there right now, He's the Lord of the end of your rope. He's no less loving. There, he's no less magnificent there. He's no less wise there. He's no less beautiful there. He's no less marvelous there. He's no less powerful there. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for just the fact that you have sovereignly ordained that these words would come down to us these words of the Bible, these words of a king devoted to you many hundreds of years ago, 
to teach us how to lament in the way that you desire. We thank you for the faithful men and women of the Bible who have been devoted to in the past. We thank you that you have provided so much for us. Even in these last difficult 18 months, the ways that you've provided for us, help us, Lord, to trust more in your promises. To trade the less real thing for the more real thing. For all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.